You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. As everybody can see here on the horizon, we have certainly reached the level where globalization is now a reality, also along with things such as global warming and terrorism. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today are two people who are going to share with us what's going to be on the horizon, especially for America. Will terror continue to be a threat, or with the help of pivotal powers, as they are called, be able to step in and be able to work together where we can all share not only thriving in the global economy, but also work together toward world peace? The book that we'll be talking about today is The Next American Century and how the U.S. can thrive as other powers rise. And I know that as I have many conversations with friends, family, and the like, they always seem to talk about China, this rising, thriving world power, especially economically speaking, and whether or not these people are going to actually dominate the world. Well, joining us today are two former uh, aides during the Clinton administration, serving with the NSC and uh, also um, uh, many other interesting things such as that, and they're joining us here today on the Beyond 50 radio program, the authors of The Next American Century, and our guest today, Nina Hatchigian and Mona Sutphin. And thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Now, this is an interesting book just because of how you kind of lay out the groundwork. It could even be somebody, maybe perhaps as myself, who is relatively a novice in many ways when it comes to politics because there's just such a dynamic when it comes to talking about politics, what our role in the U.S. is as far as world peace and so forth and so on, and also the heated debates as we've been seeing many times over the last several years with our role in Iraq. Uh, Now, what was the reason that you put this book together? Was it to share the possibility of encouragement and the things that we need to do uh, to basically stabilize this global economy? Well, it's funny. I think that we didn't know at the at the outside of writing the book that it would be encouraging. We were we were surprised and happy to find that our message is actually very optimistic. But we wrote the book to answer for ourselves the same questions that you discuss with your family. You know, what does the rise of China mean for our children? And they're, you know, are they going to be better off than us because of China in the world or less well off? You know, what, what are they going to be more secure with a stronger India or Russia or less secure? And so we didn't know the answers to those questions. We knew that the old standard Cold War framework didn't make sense to us anymore in a very different world that you described, but we we actually didn't know what the answers were. You know, it's really interesting, too, because when we take a look at the war on terrorism, it seems like a lot of people aren't really happy with our role, especially as we invaded Iraq. And you also talked about that in your book, especially as you talk about the butterfly ballot in Florida, (laughs) and all of a sudden the result of that was the invasion of Iraq. Now, why did you think that was such a problem? I mean, what was it that we made sort of, as you might say, a grave mistake in going that direction? Well, I think this is Mona. It was a couple of, of factors. Um, I mean, the most problematic, I think, for the world is that for many years since the U.S. has become a major global power, um, we created this this system of, of international rules that have basically kept the world relatively peaceful. And people... Uh, we're hoping that when we became the sole superpower that we would show the kind of restraint that um, kind of a benevolent big power would do. Um, And instead, we decided to use that power aggressively, um, unilaterally, in a way that was deeply upsetting to the rest of the world when everybody else was saying this is going to be a big mistake. Um, We made the mistaken assumption that military power um, is the only measure that that matters and that, in fact, you can decide to invade another country and just will it to be a democracy on its own. And so it, um, I think, played into all the worst fears that people had about what a potentially unchecked American aggressive power could become. And it really doesn't actually reflect the way Americans, this is the the saddest part about it, is that um, Americans really don't want to be that kind of power in the world system. We really do believe in working cooperatively with other nations to solve major problems. And so it's, it's, it's just been an unfortunate experience all the way around. And obviously, it's it's led to a lot of anti American sentiment around the world. I I would just add to that. This is Nina, that, that there's great opportunity costs to Iraq as well, that 
that money and that time and that energy and that focus of the you know of our president and, and everybody underneath him on Iraq is taking attention and time and money away from these other um, other problems that are more important you know like Afghanistan for example but also how do we deal how, you know how do we continue to thrive in a world where the, there are these other big powers you know on the landscape and those are questions that are hard to think about when there are American troops dying every day. Well, and that's just it is because here we in America have said, look, let's stop this. And when you first understand why and how our government was actually built, at least in my understanding growing up through even grade school, is that the government was here to serve the people. And saying that, the fact is that they're exact, they're not even doing that, or at least that's the perception, is they're just kind of serving themselves. You, you know, you kind of look at even films like, for instance, Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 and whether what he says is true or untrue, it doesn't really matter. The point is it got you thinking, well, wait a minute, why aren't they serving us and why do they continue to go against our wishes? Now it seems that the world is kind of looking at us as though, well, can't you guys get it together? And I know that you talk about in your book um, is when you talk about the Soviet Union as far as how they seem to respect what their government is doing and here we're trying to boast this message of the right thing to do, but at the same time what they see is a hypocrisy where we don't respect our own government. So it kind of makes you wonder, how do we ever start working toward the right resolution when they see sort of a U.S. hypocrisy, if you will? Yeah, I, I think one of the issues that we are going to have, and the next president will inherit this, and I think actually all, all three of our candidates at this point really see the need for this, which is there will be a moment where the world stops and listens and says, okay, what do you, what do you have to say now? Um, and there is, <laughs> right. a, there is a moment. Not an easy where, place to be either. Exactly. It's like it's the bad awkward, comedian following the good one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's an awkward moment, but it is a moment where we can – uh, admit that we've made some pretty strategic errors, get ourselves back on the right track, and recognize that we have to live by the same rules that we preach to everybody else. Um, we discuss this in the book about uh, the situation, you know, human rights concerns that we have in places like Russia or China, and obviously they're, they don't treat their citizens well. Um, but it becomes very difficult for us to talk about their human rights policies when we have things like Guantanamo Bay going on, and it's it makes it that much more difficult for us to push our message and push it effectively. And so, um, so there is this, I, we do believe that there is this potentially hopeful moment where people will be interested in what the next president does or says, and that could, that could ultimately change the trajectory that we've been on for the past uh, seven years or so. And I think, this is Nina, just to jump in, that, that I think that a key to, to trying to do better and engage the world better is to have you know, a constructive, pragmatic framework in which we think about these other big powers. So we basically concluded in our book that that the way we've standard the, the way our standard thinking about big powers is all wrong. That we were sort of conditioned from the rise of Germany in World War II and then the rise of the Soviet Union and the Cold War to worry when another country gains power. But that is that should not be our approach anymore because the bottom line is that we might not like them, but these guys are on our team now. China, Russia, India, Europe, Europe, and Japan, they all want, at the, at the highest level, they want what we want. They want stability. They want free trade. They want air conditioning. They want you know, fried chicken. They, it, we won the battle of the Cold War. They are all capitalists now. And, so, mm -hmm. and, and we share the same threats. We, you know, we, the, the deepest threats to American security, like terrorism and, and um, disease and climate change, though, though those other guys face those threats too, and we need to work together to to to, uh, to have any hope of addressing them. Now it's really interesting because I remember when 9/11 had happened, and I know that it seemed the common question is we were still in shock, and it took days and maybe even weeks in some cases for people to kind of snap back into reality. It was such a surreal moment here on American soil because we had never really been attacked before per se. But the fact is, then it was pointed to Muslims. Well, the fact is, then all of a sudden there was this big outburst, especially in the media, to get Americans to understand who this Muslim group was and what the difference was between the common Muslim, I suppose, and the, the super Muslims that were running around blowing up buildings. So why is this continuing to happen? Because it seemed that we had a lot of cooperation as far as our homeland security was concerned, 
during the Clinton administration, I'm not going to start pointing fingers and blaming George Bush, but it seemed right after he took open the pre- took over the presidency, a door flew open and a plane crashed into a couple of buildings. So what was going on there? I, I'd like to know, because you were part of the, I guess, the Clinton team, how was Homeland Security different during his tenure, even even before his tenure, than it was when the Bush administration took over? Well, we were looking. I mean, we were tracking Osama bin Laden very carefully um, in those in those days um, and, and years. And um, it, you know, it, Dick Clark, who was uh, the major counterterrorism czar under President Clinton when we were there. Um, you know, when when Dick Clark was really alarmed about something, everybody knew to listen very carefully. And from from what I've gathered from his book, that that isn't exactly what happened when he um, when when the administration changed office. You know, when the administration changed, he stayed there, and he was having a hard time getting the attention of the highest level folks um, about the you know about this intelligence that he was getting about a plot that was was coming. Um, so that that's maybe part of the part of the answer. Mm. We have a guest online here, and he wants to uh, pretty much, I guess, he has a question or comment. It's uh, the king, the king, the king of kings. You get these crazy little names. Okay, you're on the uh, Beyond 50 radio program. Do you have a question or a comment for Dina? Or? Yes, um, I wanted to talk about the immigration thing uh, you guys were talking about. Um, I'm actually from Tijuana, and uh, I actually don't agree. I think that everyone should be allowed in America. <laughs> I think that sharing is caring, and I might be a little underage to, for this talk, but uh, <laughs> I think that it's right that we keep everyone here. That sounds pretty reasonable enough. Thank you for joining us on the Beyond 50 radio program. It seems somebody's uh, kind of hitting that Tijuana beer a little bit early there. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's talk about <laughs> Guy, you just sometimes never know what you're going to get on yeah. something like this. But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, and actually he brings up an interesting point when you take a look at borders in Mexico. You know, it's like we're mm-hmm. kind of from uh, what you were talking about in the book. It's sort of the same thing with Taiwan and China now. What's going on there where you were talking about how China sees us as having a really good grip on what you would call their big toe? Um, well, we, China, the, the issue of Taiwan and, and whether, um, whether it's part of China is, is a really, really serious national issue for the Chinese. They are very, mm-hmm. um, very deeply concerned about it. They see mainland Chinese, see Taiwan as this sort of escaped um, or this um, distanced brother, and that it's, it's a big national priority to make sure that Taiwan does not become an independent country. Um, it's a priority of the United States, um, albeit not a priority that you know affects American lives directly, but it's a priority of the United States to make sure that Taiwan's democracy doesn't get rolled back. And basically, these two um, interests can can live together that that we are not you know head to head with china over taiwan and recently it's actually been you know relatively stable um but but it's it's always it's a it's a flashpoint that if not handled really really carefully could become you know a problem um between our in our relationship with china and we just don't we we don't want that to happen basically. right if, if the equivalent situation would be is if uh you know say Hawaii, we may not even care about Hawaii as much, actually, as the Chinese care about Taiwan. But let's say Hawaii, you know, were to somehow decide to break away and the Chinese were, you know, implicitly defending Hawaii, you know, when we were trying to have Hawaii stay as part of the United States. It really goes to the heart of their sense of national identity. And um, so it's very emotional and, and a very high priority for them. Now, I know that in a lot of the conversations that I've had that people consider as China starts becoming this uh, global power, especially in economics, uh, just becoming this huge economy, uh, they become concerned that the Chinese military can just pretty much do anything they want. But you talk about that in pretty good detail now as far as like our U.S. military versus the world military that really bar none, it's going to be pretty difficult for anybody to challenge us at least within the next five years, so to speak. Talk about that and kind of open up probably some minds to let people know, you know, your paranoia doesn't have to be as real as you think it is. Yeah. Um, It is interesting that there is a lot of paranoia about Chinese military, you know, potential military rise. And very clearly they are spending money on modernizing their military, but um, they don't have a single aircraft carrier. They have have no deep water navy. They are 
literally, I mean, not just five years, probably 25, 30, 50 years away from from being a competitive, having a competitive military to the United States, and that presumes that they decide to go and try to build a military like the United States, which is not entirely clear that that's ultimately what they're trying to do. So I think um, this goes back to part of the reason we wrote the book is we think there are oftentimes just knee-jerk assumptions that a big power rises and therefore they are threatening, Mm -hmm. must be threatening. Um, And therefore, you know, any any move they make to modernize their military is interpreted aggressively. Um, And it's understandable because that's that's our recent history, but we just think different times require a different perspective. And just to add to that, and the other thing to keep in mind is that they're a nuclear power, we're a nuclear power. In fact, all these big powers are nuclear powers, except for Japan, but they're sort of under our nuclear, you know, nuclear umbrella, if you will. And that means that, you know, we have no interest in getting into a head-to-head conflict with China. They have no interest in it. We have no interest in it. I mean, there is, you know, some deterrent, some, um, some, co- some calm that necessarily comes with the fact that, that uh, just like during the Cold War, that, you know, if you can destroy each other, you, want, you don't want to go there in terms of a head-to-head conflict. But basically, the Chinese military is, is really um, puny and, and fairly pathetic compared, compared to ours. It, you know, no matter how you measure it, whether you measure it with um, with experience, you know, they haven't had combat experience since the 70s, and we've uh, we've had an awful lot. Um, technology, hardware, um, training, you know, logistics. They don't have a single base anywhere outside of China, and we have, I think, you know, we have troops, I think, in 100 countries. So the idea that we are scared of them is just, you know, it's, it's and silly. Not only that, the Chinese find it completely ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, when well, they, they see these articles where the China's military is rising, they look around and say, well, what, 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 do they know something we don't know? Because we're looking around. And the last time we checked, the United States was so far ahead of us. It's, it's, it, it defies, it's illogical to them that somehow the United States would be worried about them. But, but, all, yeah. but it's important also to say, like, they, it, would, it would do everybody some good if they were a little bit more transparent about why you know what they were like what they wanted to buy and why they were wanting to buy, buy it, it you know right. that would that would stabilize things it would give us a measure of you know our our pentagon a measure of calm about you know why it is that why it is they're doing what they're doing because after all you know we pay our military to think of everything and to make sure you know to keep us safe under any circumstances so you know they see the modernization and they and they are you know they're rightfully interested in it but so it would do it would do everybody some good if, if China would be kind of more upfront with, with their plans. Yeah. Well, not to mention, too, when you consider even the history of China and relation to the United States, uh, they pretty much supported us in many different ways, not only building the country along with the railroads and whatnot, but they were also pretty heavily involved in helping us build airstrips during World War II when we were having the mm-hmm. Pacific Campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, literally, if it hadn't have been for them and their ability to be able to supply so many people to do what they did, we might not have had the devastating effect on, for instance, Hiroshima and Nagasaki because we wouldn't have been able to have those long-range bombers be where they were. So you could see how they helped participate in all that as well. Now, in your book, you're contending, basically, look, for globalization to happen and to be effective, we've got to get rid of the old paradigm that just because somebody's coming into wealth or coming into their own, they're out to destroy the world. Now, why do we continue to hang on to that uh, line of thinking. I, I think um, we we try to point to a few uh, answers, but um, the, well, the good news. Let's start with this: is that Americans, uh, as a whole, don't really have that attitude. It's it's the policymakers that do. But right. Americans, if you ask them, they actually they don't have a negative view of China yet, um, and they basically are are open to sharing power. They don't want to be this dictating superpower. They want to really collaborate, and they even will do that. They even want to do that if it means having to give up on our interests some of the time. So if you ask Americans, you know, do you want to collaborate with others, even if it means that we have to sacrifice our interests to some degree, and they say yes. But if you ask that same question about policymakers, they, they will say something different. And more than that, they don't understand, like our, our people in Congress don't understand that that's what Americans really think. Um, so there's a disconnect between the, the American point of view and then what are what the folks in Washington think. Um, yeah, uh, just to chime in, this is Mona. That part of it is also that we are very um, Americans. Really, at the end of the day, are very pragmatic and interested in you know hardworking, pragmatic, entrepreneurial. Want to fix the issue. Want to move quickly to resolve problems. 
So if you um, paint this picture where we can work collaboratively and fix a, a problem, whatever it is around the world, that is going to be cheaper and easier and quicker by working together with people, most Americans will say, okay, even if the ultimate outcome is not 100% ideal, they would say, well, it's, it's going to get resolved more quickly. And that somehow doesn't, doesn't translate up into the, into the overarching policies. And I think there is this Cold War overhang, um, because it is really our history um, at least for the rise up until the Soviet Union, that big powers like that had become aggressive. Um, but even, you know, if you look back into the 1990s when Japan was rising as a power, we got very panicked about Japan being a, being a rising power, even though it's a teeny place compared to the United States and they have no military. And, you know, but it, we worked ourselves into a frenzy about that. So there is, you know, there is an element that once the media gets a hold of it and politicians get a hold of it, it can it can tap into anxiety that Americans have about their own future. Yeah, because basically, you know, at the end of the day, just like you said, what they want to do is spend time with the family. They want to let sometimes a cable TV wash all over them or maybe take a sporting event and not have to worry about the fact that when they go to a stadium, somebody's going to drop a bomb in the Blow middle of the whole thing. Right. And again, it's like... Why do we continue to allow even the media, for instance, as well as what you were talking about there, our politicians, to keep thinking in this way, well, the best way that you can understand we're serving you is by giving you a reason to be afraid to justify why you're paying us in the first place. <laughs> I think that's it just part doesn't of it. make any sense sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I think that's definitely part of it. It's also, you know, it's a lot easier to point your finger at another country than to fix the problem that caused it here at home. So, it's you know, it's easier to point your finger and say, you know, they're taking our jobs as opposed to, and even though that may not really be true, as opposed to coming up with a program here to really help our workers, you know, who, mm -hmm. most of whom are, are, are not losing their jobs because of trade, but they're losing their jobs because of technology changes. But, you know, we're leaving our workers high and dry here in the U.S. We're not helping them. And, we, you know, we've got programs that are 50 years old trying to help workers of today, and it, it just doesn't make sense anymore. The New Deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, we should, there are all kinds of, you know, in researching for the book, we found there's all kinds of great ideas out there. There's, you know, you could have wage insurance. So if you lose your job, then, you know, if you if you take a new one and you don't get paid as much, you, you know, you can make up the difference. And the, or universal health care would help because then at mm -hmm. least if you lose your job, you're not losing your kid's, you know, ability to go to the doctor. So, I mean, there's and there's a whole range of them. But but basically, it's a lot easier to say it's those guys that are that are hurting us as opposed to saying, Okay, yeah, we really you know, we really need to, to do some hard work on our domestic agenda here. And now taking a look at the pivotal powers and you were just talking about uh jobs in America going overseas and usually it seems to be jobs that most Americans don't want. You know, they usually want the high paying jobs that usually don't require a lot of working hours for prestige, whatever the case may be, but we tend to farm out a lot of things that basically can be automated anyway, and that's why, for instance, India is starting to rise in such an incredible way as far as their working middle class, which is really good for India. It, it's good for India, but keep in mind, when we did the analysis of, of outsourcing, it turns out that outsourcing accounts for very small amount, just about 2% of the jobs lost every year are lost to, to outsourcing. Most of the jobs in the United States are lost because of technology change. Um, and, you know, if India creates a big thriving middle class, um, that means that there will be more Indians who are interested in, in buying American goods and services. And so we're not saying that there isn't any downside to off, out, off, outsourcing, outsourcing and offshore, offshoring because – you know, if you live in a small town or even a medium-sized town, you know, and you're in Pennsylvania or Ohio or whatever, and the, the company gets up and it leaves, it's left and it's taken all the jobs with it. But it is America's problem to fix right. what happens when there's job dislocation, right? It's not India's problem to fix the fact that we haven't figured out how to take care of our workers or give, them, give people health insurance or make sure that pensions are safe mm -hmm. and that people can retire with a sense of security for their, you know, for their for the last, you know, 40 years of their life. Um, all of that is America's issues. Th those are America's issues to solve, not China's, not India's, not any other country. But that's what's funny when you hear it in the conversation is Americans will tend to, as you said, and, and you see, hear it all the time, you know, we're blaming uh, Mexico, we're blaming India, we're going to blame China, we're going to blame everybody on the planet for why things are getting worse here instead of doing something about it. And in your book you do talk about that's one of the first places because we're always going to be a global player or a global power, especially in a global economy. It's very necessary. You can see 
the symbiosis between all of this, but it's a matter of us not going around and pushing people and say, that's fine, but you're going to do it the way we tell you to do it. And that's what you're saying is frustrating countries around the world. Exactly. And I mean, in terms of the previous, I mean, we can't have a policy based on the idea that poor countries should stay poor. That That's just not, that's not morally right. It's not practical. It's not what the United States stands for. So we have to find a way where they can, they can do better and we can do better also. And frankly, that's pretty much on the broadest level. That is what happens. I mean, as these middle classes grow, you know, they, they spend more money on, on U.S., on U.S. stuff and, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Starbucks and Ford and um, many other U.S. companies are doing great in, in, uh, in China and, and these other emerging economies. Um, but we do, you know, we have to, we have to change our attitude. Um, and it has, you know, American leadership is absolutely critical. Let's be clear about that. I mean, if we mm-hmm. want to solve global problems, we America really does have to get involved. But at the same time, we need to encourage these other big powers to, you know, take a seat at the table with us and to act responsibly and to pay for some of some of these, um, you know, some of these uh, public goods that we all enjoy, that everybody enjoys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good stuff on uh we're talking today about the America, the next American century is the title of the book, and uh, our guest today, Nina Hatchigan and Mona Sutphin, joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Now, let's talk about the individual global powers and how they're trying to, um, I guess, infuse. Are they actually going to try to make an effort to come to terms to work together, or how is this all going to play out? Well, it, you know, we went power by power in the book. Um, again, right. it's it's the you know the EU, Japan, Russia, India, and China, and what we found was that was interesting about their the, at this point, um, the partial exception of Russia, they all really do want a seat at the table. They all are very interested in having more respect, more of a voice in the global system, and we really need to take advantage of that this moment where they really do want to play by our rules and the rules of the game that we basically have established since the end of World War II and accommodate that interest so that we can have, um, we can have their power, resources, energy, time, and attention focused in a really productive way. Um, and when you think about it, we're talking about, together with the United States, it's six, these six powers alone control two-thirds of the global economy and we're half of the world's population. So if we decide that we want to try to fix something and move in a particular direction, we really can move the needle on some of the on some of the more difficult issues that we face out there. Um, and so it is a moment where where there is room for American leadership while we still you know while we still have a very um, disproportionate level of power in the international system to be able to pull these powers in. Hmm. I just it all seems so messy but at the same time it seems like it's kind of actually trying to find its own life force definitely now um how has uh, from your experience how have these pivotal powers viewed the u.s is it because sometimes you hear well you know they're kind of looking at us with scorn or sometimes they're looking at us but there's some respect there and then they're looking at us well there's possibilities so how were we at right now it's it's kind of a mixed picture i mean if you if you ask um people in other countries about their views toward Americans, the people, they're very positive. Mm-hmm. Um, their view of our government is, is, has gone downhill dramatically in the, in the last seven years, um, mm-hmm. for, you know, in some cases really dramatically. Like, for example, in Germany, um, I think it's gone from something like 80, you know, 80% of the population sort of being favorable toward the U.S. government to something like 30% now. It's, it's, it's quite dramatic. And a lot of that's Iraq, but it's, it's – um, even before Iraq, it was um, a lot of decisions to uh, kind of throw out uh, international treaties that that you know we had previously committed to, and that the, a lot of the other countries in the world are very uh, are, are very um, keen on. Uh, so, you know, on the other hand, everybody, all these big powers want a really good relationship with the United States. They they recognize that that having that stable relationship with the U.S. is it really important to their own interests, uh, whether it's you know security interests or or economic interests. So we have that kind of going for us, um, and we we have this position as sort of the least distrusted power. Right. So other I countries might not, that. you know, other countries might not trust us tremendously, but they trust each other even less. Uh, among, <laughs> among these big powers, because uh, you know they've got long histories of of, yeah. of wars. Most with of them each have other. fought wars yeah. with each other. 
Many of them. And, and, you know, we are, we've got these big oceans on either side of us, and that makes us, to some degree, just less threatening to them. It also makes us feel more secure and less threatened by them, you know, to some degree. But they're all sitting on top of each other. So, you know, they're, they're trying to make friends now, you know, China with Russia, Russia with India, oh, India with China. China. Um, China with with Europe, et cetera, um, and you know Japan with with all of them as well. But um, but underneath that it is this sort of currency of of concern. Now, when you talk about us being the least trusted, one of the reasons that, uh, as you uh, talk about in the book, that makes a lot of sense to me is how we were able to jump to countries' aid. You take a look at the big earthquake that happened in Mexico or even the tsunami, and you even gave price comparisons with how much we were able to help with aid over there, as, and not just monetarily, but also with troops and supplies versus what China was able to contribute. So you can see that basically we've said we can walk the talk and we're going to do it, especially when you need help, and that's a very American ideal. You know, that's really part of the American experiment is when you begin to thrive that you begin to also help others do the same. And uh, But it just seems that over several years that sometimes we take a position, well, no, that's fine that you want to thrive, but we're only going to let you get so far. And so you're suggesting or it's hopefully beginning to happen that that is changing. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the central – if you look back since since the beginning – since the end of World War II – our basic message and our ba- and our foreign aid and really our whole foreign policy has been about convincing other countries about the merits of democracy and capitalism, open markets, and for the most part, those ideas have won, right? So after years of preaching to the Indias of the world and the Chinas of the world, you got to open up your markets, you got to do this, you got to do that. They've started to do those things. And then all of a sudden when they start to do those things, and guess what? They work, right? So they're doing better. Then we go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're succeeding so, just a little too much there. <laughs> yeah. We didn't think it was that easy. <laughs> right, exactly. Wait a minute. You, we, you actually are following what we're saying? That's, that's, can't do that. Well, especially when you take a look at uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, and when they finally became a democracy, so to speak. But now, from my understanding, what you were saying is, they kind of want to change that, but do they still want to hold on to the capitalistic idea? It, it, it's capitalism, but but it's it's not our it's not our model of capitalism. It's it's got definitely you know heavy sort of state intervention. Um, but I think that they will <clears throat> likely find as as you know as many countries have that, that that there's really a limit to how successful economically you can be with that. And really, Russia needs to to diversify its economy if it's going to continue to do well. The, they're, you know, short term, they're very high on, on high oil prices, and that's fine for now. But, um, you know, they, they are not investing in producing any more energy, and they, they haven't let other – they haven't invested in other sectors. Um, so in the long term, they're going to they're gonna need to do – you know, get beyond just, just relying on, on oil and gas. Well, speaking of oil and gas, too, is that uh, we consume quite a bit here in the United States, and everybody seems to be sniveling and whining about the fact that gas prices are over $3, $4 a gallon in some cases, but then you take a look at how Europe handled that situation. We haven't really talked a whole lot about Europe yet, but they almost seem to be like a pivotal superpower that maybe in many ways... Uh, could influence the United States to get out of their old paradigm, I mean, because they have experience having been through two world wars. So maybe kind of share their view and and some of the things that they're doing that maybe we can feel more encouraged about all of this hopefully coming together. Yeah, I mean, I think the Europeans, what's interesting, we we treat them as one in the book, even though they're obviously individual, you know, Germany, UK, whatever, France. Um, And we treated them as one because increasingly they're acting as one, particularly economically because of the European Union with the single currency and all that. Um, And, you know, they really do view power in a a different way. They really believe in the multilateral system and the rules of international laws and norms, which, which is understandable because they've had two incredibly painful world wars in just one century. Um, the idea of use of, you know, they're very uncomfortable with the use of military force, um, very uncomfortable with kind of certainly our policy vis-a-vis Iraq. And, but, you know, even on areas, though, like on climate change and some of these other things, they, um, you know, they have a very high gasoline is incredibly expensive in, in Europe because they have a very high gasoline tax. Um, they have very small energy-efficient cars. Um, and some of that is just their natural, is the way their cities are built, et cetera, et cetera, and their ethos and their culture. But I think that um, 
there is more of a willingness to to see how Europe is is um, affecting the rest of the world. And maybe that's because of colonial history. Maybe it's because of the way um, th those ties, and so they have more economic and cult cultural and social ties with the rest of the world. But there is this feeling that they have become, um, whereas we, before we used to be seen as having the kindest hearts and the, and the most uh, sympathetic and willing participants to help the le least developed countries improve their improve their plight, that somehow that has fallen by the wayside, and that mantle has been taken up by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can also see how innovative they are about uh, their problems. For instance, when you look at their gas prices, I understand it's 5 6 maybe $7 a gallon. Then they start riding bicycles. Right. <laughs> you know, So they're, they're not contributing to the global warming situation. Now, they you are, but at, not as the, to the same degree as, that yeah, we are. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, as we absolutely. are. So that's just it, is that we continue to say, okay, do as we say, not as we do. We're going to go ahead and still use gas. We're going to still contribute to global warming. But then all of a sudden China steps in. They'll become this world power. They'll start living an American way, you will, of consumption. So they could very quickly even surpass what we're doing. But then their attitude is, well, you can't tell us to stop doing that. Look what you're doing. That's exact. That's exactly what they are saying, you know, because we and, and they are going to surpass us probably next year as the biggest um, emitter of of these greenhouse gases that are that are you know wreaking havoc with our environment already, and it's just mm -hmm. going to get worse. And I'm sure you read about how like a piece of ice the size of Connecticut broke off in in, in Antarctica a couple of days ago, um, oh which goodness. just really was jarred me. But in any case, I mean, if we really want to tackle that problem, we absolutely have to lead. I mean, the United States has to say, okay, we are transforming to a low-carbon economy, and here's how we're going to do it, and we are going to do it seriously. This is what, you know, we think the next president ought to make a, a priority, um, and that will get everyone else to follow. But we cannot say, yeah, exactly, China. You know, you you guys don't, you know, none you know, none of you even own toasters or air conditioners, and and yet we're driving SUVs, and and you know, and you should be the ones to cut back. It's just not a, you know, it's just not it's not a message that resonates, and it's not a message that works. So it's a, it's a place where we really need American leadership, and, and also Japanese leadership, because it turns out Japan is the most energy efficient country in the world. They are really phenomenal. They're leaps and bounds ahead of us. And, and how they can serve in all kinds of ways, in very creative, um, innovative ways, and the government's quite involved. And uh, and and that's you know they they also should be should be you know showing us the way. And we should be letting them show us the way. It's also, there I, I, we do think that there's an opportunity for this, in part because you know because oil prices are so high and gasoline prices are so high, and people are looking at what's going on in the Middle East. This is a moment where all of these issues kind of come together. We need to have a lower carbon economy. We also need to do something about the fact that we're so addicted to oil. Um, and those two things come together. Um, and it's going to take, obviously, a long time to change the, what, the way we, we use energy naturally in our economy all the time. Um, but we can get there because people are seeing what the impact is of not going there, right, which is both at the, at the prices at the pump and, um, you know, potentially us all living on house, houseboats. Yeah, exactly. Also getting to a point where we don't overconsume as well. I mean, we seem to also sometimes be a throwaway economy where we buy cheap things and then when they finally die out, then we just kind of toss them toss away. Them. And, and, and certainly that sends off a message that that's what what capitalism or becoming a, a growing economy is all about, is being able to spend money and, and, and basically waste but what should be happening is taking that, maybe working more on research and development to being cleaner, to being more efficient, to being less wasteful. And certainly that can frustrate a lot of other countries around the world when they see us consume close to one-fifth of the world's natural resources and we're so just at times slovenly sloppy about how we use those resources. But then here are countries who are even less endowed saying, would you knock it off because this is what we would do, you know, and maybe kind of reach out and say to them, okay, well, what would you do? Give us some ideas. Yeah, I mean, right now we're giving, um, you know, China and India a total free pass. And um, I think it's, you know, whoever the next president is, there is, there is again, a moment because the Kyoto framework is expiring and there's a discussion about how really the world should come together on this question of dealing seriously with greenhouse gases. And so there is a moment, but we, we have to – show unless we show that we are serious and willing to move in in a pretty what will be a painful direction for most Americans um the rest of the world is going to say see they're just they're complaining about everybody else that they don't want to do anything themselves mhm mm
Hmm, interesting stuff. Now, upcoming elections, I don't know, but uh, what do you think? I mean, we have three candidates here that obviously want to move in a different direction, but do you see any of them as real players at this point with where we're at to changing perhaps the way we think about things into a new direction, or how long do you believe this is going to take? Well, I think I do think that they are all kind of staking out a somewhat different approach. I mean, we I think take a bit of issue with with John McCain's stance toward Russia. I mean, Russia is a really easy target right now because they, um, well, they're not helping their their own image any at all by being, um, you know, kind of um, unconstructive about about Kosovo and and belligerent in some ways. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we cannot, as John McCain suggests, um, you know, try to kick Russia um, out of some international groups that it's in. Um, and uh, we have to treat them, you know, we ought to be treating them with respect. And in fact, Putin is going to be meeting with Bush in a in a, in a couple of weeks. We, we don't necessarily like what they're doing and we don't necessarily like them. But the fact is that they are really uh, key for us in, in, in a couple of respects. One is proliferation, where, you know, a lot of um, uh, bomb ready material is lying around Russia unguarded. And if we want to make sure that terrorists don't get their hands on that material and potentially use it against us in the United States, we have to work with Russia. And they want to work with us too. They're actually, uh, they're a co-founder and a co-leader with us of a group of 50 nations that are working on trying to keep nuclear material out of the hands of terrorists. And on Iran as well, they they enjoy a long relationship with Iran. So if we want to roll back Iran's nuclear program, we got to work with Russia. But McCain McCain is sounding very much like a cold warrior when it comes to Iran. On, on China, he's not. He's a little bit more nuanced. Um, and I'd say that um, on the Democratic side, I mean, I think that both both Obama and Clinton um, have have been pretty. That their overall foreign policy is very much you know, geared toward um, America rejoining the world and being um, a leader and not necessarily being or in, and no longer being the the the, uh, the country that's upsetting the apple cart. Sure. It's sort of like the bully on the playground that says, play by my rules or don't play at all. Right. Or I'm going to take my marbles home. <laughs> this is the thing is that that has been that's been that's been we're going to take our marbles home. But the problem that we're now starting to face is that people will play marbles without us. Right. right. It used to be we take the marbles home and then the game stopped because we own all the marbles. Now it just continues and they're like, okay, that's one less player. And then pretty soon you'll have U.S. made marbles that'll run you twenty-five dollars a marble. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, again, as I was reading through the book, and I'm not big. I mean, as far as politics go, when I take the opportunity to really find out. I'll dive into books such as yourself. I won't really listen to the news because what you tend to see is a lot of sound bites or a lot of bias going a different direction. And, you know, on our particular program, the Beyond 50 radio program, we really try to approach things very holistically from as many angles as you can possibly find. And what's unique about this is it kind of really opened my eyes, as I said in the beginning of the program, that you don't have to be big on politics. You don't even have to be a political science major. But this really kind of opens your eyes about what really is going on in the world. And you seem to come away from after reading your book with a, a particular common sense, like, well, that's what I was thinking the whole time, so how come we can't seem to get our get so-called governmental leaders to be doing the same thing? Do we need to maybe change our political system where we no longer allow, say, career political leaders who are just, that's all they know is politics instead of humanity? I mean, what steps do we take to being able to solve some of these problems here on, on our own homeland? Well, I think one of the big big issues does come to um, who we elect as leaders. Right. I mean, it's it's... There's, if you had to fix one thing, right, I mean, the, the, obviously the government is very complex and it's going to take a long time for it to move in a particular direction, but having the right enlightened leadership that understands the world that we're, we, we are encountering now and not nostalgic for what might have been 20 years ago or 30 years ago or um, trying to fit facts to fit a particular narrative that may or may not actually make any sense. It, that having the right executive leadership, the right president, is more important than any other single factor you can have because they can bring along the American people. They can bring along the congressional leadership and other policymakers. They can even bring along the media um, because, you know, the media is an un – I'm always saying, at least in this – particularly this election, but just in, in – Washington policymaking generally, they're like the third player on the, at the table sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. <laughs> because they decide that they like a particular narrative and they will run with that narrative whether the facts fit the narrative or not because they think the narrative is interesting, right? They're looking for drama and things that are scary and things that will gain viewers' attention, which is often so things watch that Fox are... News is what you're saying. Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you see this even in this election. You know, you, you cannot, you know, the, the back and forth between Obama and Clinton, that's good for ratings, right? So right. What, the fact that both candidates really want to get on to talk about other things, it doesn't matter because the media wants to keep that going to some degree. It helps them, you know, sell advertising on the, on, on their stations and sell newspapers sure. and the like. So, um so I actually think that's the most important thing. And then in the book, we have some specific ideas about how you um, f- frame issues and how some things you have to actually take directly to the American people and talk to the American people about um, so that you can build a consensus at the grassroots to try to change things that are more fundamental. I mean, I think what Americans should also do is try to go to some of these countries and then, you know, come back and, and talk about it with their friends or, or talk about it online. I mean, there's all kinds of forums now, you know, especially on the Internet where, um, you know, and those and those and that those discussions can be very influential, even if they're you know just by ordinary people. But I think that um, you know Americans traveling to these places and 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 seeing them for themselves, I think you know could have a big effect. Um, but really, I mean, the reason we wrote the book was to try to get this conversation started because it's not really a conversation we've had in this country. And so, you know, this is our tiny contribution, but this is, you know, a place to start anyway is is to have these kinds of conversations just like the one we're having, which, which you know, did not happen before in terms of looking at these other big countries. So now we finally come to what seems to be the center problem of what all of our pivotal powers, especially uh, even us in the United States, are trying to work with, and that is the war on terrorism. There's the nuclear threat that we were talking about earlier. There's the biological weapons uh, threat that we've been talking about. And then the the other one, which is kind of like one of those outside ones we were talking about, which was global warming. Now, what's with the terrorists? I think sometimes a lot of people, when they take a look at this crazy group of people that in their own right name think they're doing the right thing, and then they tag themselves to being Muslim, or it could even be Christian. You've seen this happen over the centuries. It was always this extreme group claiming this area of God, and then going around and just creating havoc. So what's going on there? Uh, Because this is one of the most important elements about all of us coming together, because of India being able to help the United States. They were able to track, as we were talking about, Osama bin Laden and his cell, al-Qaeda, and so forth. But you could see a real cooperation where terrorism can almost disappear. So, you know, you kind of wonder yourself, oh, well, what do we do now? You know, where do we start from? I mean, the good news is that in terms of these um, these big these pivotal powers that we talk about, they we are all on the same page in feeling that we face a serious terrorist threat. So so that's good news for America because it means everybody is motivated to try to help. And so we are helping them, and they are all helping us um, in terms of intelligence gathering and and in some other ways. And we can just talk about that a little. Um, for example, there are I, I'm. I think we're pretty convinced there are Americans alive today because of the good work of Scotland Yard and uh, and the other British intelligence agencies because they've stopped terrorist attacks that were going to you know take place across the Atlantic Ocean before uh, before they happened and we could not have done that I mean the, you know our intelligence agencies couldn't have done that we couldn't have found them couldn't have arrested them um, so that's you know one example. India has been this has been an expert in Islamic extremist groups for decades because they used to just attack India, and now they attack us too. But the fact is, that India has quite a head start on us in trying to understand what they want and who they are and how they operate. And so that kind of cooperation with India is really important as well. I mean, China allows American inspectors in their biggest ports to check screen to, to screen shipping containers for any kind of smuggled uh, nuclear device. And there's something like, you know, over 3 million containers come from China to the U.S., you know, shipping containers every year. And so being able to check those before they arrive in the United States for, for nuclear materials is, you know, really critical to, to our security. So all, all these countries um, very much share the threat. And, and secondarily, I mean, an important, um, important reason that terrorists are able to operate is that they get sympathy from their communities for these really extremist messages of Osama bin Laden and others. 
And America right now cannot credibly, cannot, if, you know, not with anyone really listening, say, you know, give our side of the story about why, you know, why democracy is a good idea and why human rights are a good idea. No one wants to listen to us about that anymore. But luckily, we've got partners like India and like Europe um, whom, whom they might listen to. Hmm. It just it just it seems encouraging. It's going to take time to unravel, obviously, where we're at, especially the way the world views America. But I remember I was reading somewhere that in this election, what's important is the fact that the world sees uh, an African American and then they see a white woman that are running for president. So that seems encouraging to the world that we're willing or we're looking for change. Does that seem like a pretty decent symbolism for America? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, we've been really struck. I've been very struck by hearing, reading about how fascinated the world is with this election. I mean, I had to. I think of, even Americans are. I mean, <laughs> Americans are totally fascinated with it. But I had a group of um, Brazilians who were um, visiting uh, the United States a couple of weeks ago, and they know things about you know super delegates. They asked me about super delegates, right? Wow. How does what, how what's the difference between a super delegate and a regular delegate, and are they required by law to you know to vote in a particular direction or you know choose in a particular direction? And people, for whatever reason, I think this this gets to one of the core messages in our book, which is that people are very disappointed in what has happened in the United States over the over the past period, but they really want the United States to be a productive and the kind of leader that we have been in the past. And so I think people, the, the idea that we might tackle our own, the fact that we are, might elect an African-American or a woman president, which is something that most people would think that could never happen, because for the most part, it couldn't happen in their countries, not all of them, obviously. But it, the idea that people um, who've been discriminated against in this country could somehow rise to the top, that is the quintessential American message, right? It is, you you can start from nothing, and you can end up being the 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 most powerful person in, in, in the entire, you know, of all the nations in the world. And that in itself is a very symbolically powerful message, and I think that's part of the reason why it's resonating around the world. That and the fact that people are just, you know, want, want to see what happens in the United States next, what kind of power is going to emerge after this, after this period. And then one we haven't talked about that a lot of people seem worried about in a direction that maybe we should have addressed instead of Iraq is Korea. Yeah, North Korea is, is a great example of actually how much we need these other pivotal powers. So the, basically, we have no chance of stopping North Korea's nuclear program unless we are very well aligned with China and Russia and Japan and also South Korea. That The United States it has to be engaged in the problem because we also can't solve it if the United States isn't engaged. And the Bush administration was not engaged in, for a couple of years there. Um, but to their credit, they, they established this, this process where China is hosting these talks uh, with, with the North Koreans. And now we're in a place where North Korea cannot play us off each other, which is what they've always done in the past. And now oh. we are fairly aligned together. And only when that happens are we, do we have any prayer of getting them to, to give up their nuclear weapons. All exciting, interesting stuff. And all in the end, what we want to do at the end of the day is just be safe, enjoy time with our families, and That's maybe right. indulge in our creativity as well. Again, this is just a fascinating book, you know, as as far as uh, as I've been reading. And it's The Next American Century for those of us, uh, those of you joining us here on the program, How the U.S. Can Thrive as Other Powers Rise. And our guest today, Nina Hatchigian and Mona Sutphin. And um, it's been, you know, really a pleasure to get your insights on this, especially from the other side of the mirror, so that people understand that things, well, they're kind of rough, but they're not as bad as they seem. Would you say that that would be a very encouraging message? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we end our book with, with the analogy of Tiger Woods, who, um, you know, who was, is, who became... He should be our next president. <laughs> Him and Donald Trump, I think, would be just fantastic. <laughs> what a team. <laughs> um, you know, he, be, he, he, ra he, ra he rose to the rank of number one in golf faster than anyone ever has. And then he took time off, and he did this twice. He took time off from his incredibly winning career to completely revamp his swing. And we basically say that's what the United States needs to do. We're at the apex of our power, but we need to reinvest at home. And, and if we do that, and if we solve some of these big problems that we've got at home, that we've got, you know, we've got all kinds of wonderful 
um, things about this country, a wonderful assets. We've got great creative people. We've got a super innovation system. We have a really good form of government, even though it seems dysfunctional at times. It's better than anything else that's out there. Um, <laughs> that's you know, true. Good natural resources, you know, cre- smart people. So, so we've got what we need to, to do great, and we just got to, you know, do some work at home and, and change our attitude. And, and, yeah, it's a very optimistic message. Yeah. I think one of the most optimistic things to consider, too, when you have that point about, well, you know, it may not be doing so well, that is our government, it's better than anything else that's out there, is only in America can you become a millionaire making fun of our leaders on film. (laughs) (laughs) It's really been a delight to talk with the both of you. And, uh, you know, an encouraging message to Americans uh, uh, through our radio program, what would you like to say to our listeners to let them know, you know, don't be paranoid because being paranoid can cause you to make bad decisions, and we've certainly seen that over the last eight years, at least a few bad decisions anyway. Absolutely. I mean, it's one thing to be um, concerned about our future because we do sure. have some daunting challenges, but um, you know, fear can make you make yes, very, some very bad decisions. Um, and when we look at all of the challenges that are before us, we actually have the means to fix and resolve many of the problems that we face so that we can all live lead prosperous and and safe um, lives well into the future. So we just need to focus on on some of the issues we face and and get on with it. And things aren't as complicated as we seem to think they are at times, too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, again, I really applaud this. This has been a very good read, and I encourage the listeners out there, pick up a copy of this book. That way you can kind of get a really good overall view about what's going on that don't allow people to make you feel afraid when you know that you can realize that there's something that you can do about it. One of the things, obviously, to do is to vote. Hopefully, we'll start developing a system where we can have a a better way to vote better leaders, as you were suggesting earlier in the program. And I'd like to thank both of you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. It's our pleasure. Thanks very much for having us. You bet. Thank you very much. Again, the book is The Next American Century, How the U.S. Can Thrive as Other Powers Rise, and our guests joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program, Nina Hatchigan and Mona Sutphin, its authors. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for all the listeners out there joining us today. Be sure to go to our website, beyond50radio.com, that is 50 with a 5-0, where you'll find out more about this on our blog, our little blog frog there, and also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. And again, thank you for joining us today. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past halfway.